the Deputy Director General responsible for international trade at the Department of Trade and Industry in South Africa. South Africa has embarked on a process of developing a comprehensive uh, intellectual property uh, policy. This process um, has started because we do not currently have a comprehensive IP policy. We currently protect um, IP through a number of legislative frameworks, uh, including the Constitution. Section 25 of the South African Constitution protects uh, property rights. And um, in South Africa, we've decided on an expansive definition of property rights, uh, which includes uh, not only land, but also intellectual property. So as a result, already we do protect IP, but um, what we are embarking on now is a process of developing a comprehensive IP policy. And uh, in undertaking this difficult task, uh, what we've done is to embark on a consultative process that involves engagement with critical stakeholders in the IP sphere, both from civil society, industry, NGOs, but also um, our trading partners, which are critical towards the development of this process. What we've done as a country is to ensure that we adopt a balanced approach to IP that will ensure that as a country we protect IP rights, but at the same time the policy must respond to South Africa's development uh, dynamics and goals. In the National Development Plan, which is our vision 2030, we have a vision of moving towards a knowledge economy, which requires that we promote innovation as a country, which requires that we promote research and development, and as a result, uh, we are looking at developing a balanced uh, policy that will ensure that we put um, in place measures that will allow us to um, achieve our broader development objectives as I've um, indicated. In terms of where we are in the process, we developed a consultative uh, framework document which we used uh, to solicit inputs from all stakeholders. And having received those inputs, we drafted um, the current uh, draft IP policy. And the draft um, is now in the public domain for the interested parties to make submissions into the process. And uh, the deadline for the submission of inputs is the 17th of November. So we're engaging uh, uh, comprehensively with all the stakeholders so that they can make inputs into the process and the aim is to then uh, finalize um, the policy. What we've also done as the country beyond the balanced approach uh, to IP is to ensure that we rather adopt a phased approach towards the development of this comprehensive policy. IP touches on a number of areas. Uh, you have IP and public health, you have agriculture, you have environment, uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity and uh, biotechnology. So the number of aspects that are involved including competition. So what we've done is to say given um, the broad spectrum of IP and the need to take an informed and well balanced approach, we will um, rather adopt a phase approach. So what is currently in the public domain is a draft uh, that involves only phase one of the policy. And the phase one includes um, IP and public health. Uh, we're looking at areas of enhancing um, coordination when it comes to international cooperation on IP, but also uh, looking at enhancing intergovernmental coordination when it comes to IP, so that we adopt a coordinated approach when we engage in the multilateral forum. What the IP policy also does is to introduce key reforms. And some of the reforms um, have already been in our legislative uh, framework and its policy tools and measures we have not used um, before. Um, but we are now putting it under this comprehensive IP policy, all the policy measures that we will um, explore using uh, going forward. And um, I will just mention the critical ones. Um, we, we're looking at introducing substantive search and examination of patents into uh, the, the patent examination system. What we currently have as a country deploying is a depository system. 
And the depository system has its own shortcomings in that um, all we're looking at are the formalities of the application without necessarily examining uh, the, the patent applications that are submitted to us. Um, as I said, the key principles that underpin uh, the development of this policy is a balanced approach and a phased approach. So even when you talk about uh, introducing the substantive search and examination process, what we're looking at is um, developing the adequate and requisite um, capacity. And we're currently training about 18 examiners that are going through a comprehensive two-year program so that they can um, be well prepared to undertake um, this task. We have uh, given them exposure to a number of jurisdictions and IP offices so that they are not only looking at the theoretical side uh, of, of examinations, but also they can get practical exposure to the examination of patents. Um, we will have an intake of another 20 uh, going forward so that over time we are able to build um, the necessary capacity. Knowing that we're only training 18, uh, what we're also looking at is to ensure that we will still maintain and have an efficient process of granting patents. So we are currently engaged in a process of um, concluding collaborative um, arrangements and cooperative arrangements with key IP offices. We have concluded an MOU with the European uh, Patent uh, Office that will assist us to address any backlogs or delays as we embark in the process of the substantive search and examination. But also we are saying um, we would need to look at um, introducing key flexibilities that are available um, in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, the TRIPS agreement is the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights Agreement of the WTO. So we will utilize um, the TRIPS flexibilities that we have. Again, uh, we will do so in a manner that will ensure that we protect IP rights, but at the same time respond to the development dynamics of South Africa. And um, phase one, um, as I've said, involves IP and public health. So we've engaged thoroughly with uh, all the affected parties and what we've done is to also say we will make provision in this um, uh, policy for introducing a patent opposition uh, processes. Um, again, this will be done in a balanced way and a phased approach and in the immediate term while we're building capacity uh, to deal with other aspects of patent opposition such as pre and post grant, uh, we'll be looking at introducing uh, third-party submissions, which will assist to augment the capacity that we have uh, through the examiners, so that we have a thorough process of examining uh, the patents and also leverage information that is already in the public domain, uh, so that um, the um, examiners have the necessary information for them to make objective um, decisions with, when it comes to granting of patents. We also um, indicate in the policy that um, we have a functional arrangements that already exist, especially in the pharmaceutical sector, where um, our companies and uh, also patent holders um, have been able to grant voluntary licenses uh, in cases where there is a need to do so. So through a consultative process, the Department of Health would engage the patent holders and then through a voluntary mechanism they would be able to ensure that we have the necessary medicines that we need to address uh, public health uh, needs. So um, those mechanisms will continue and we recognize the value of having those mechanisms in place. Of course uh, we will preserve um, the right to introduce uh, compulsory licenses when there is a need uh, to do so. It's a mechanism that we already have in our legislation. We have never used it before because the voluntary mechanisms have functioned and functioned very well. So um, those mechanisms will be there, but we will preserve uh, the space to utilize uh, compulsory licenses uh, if there is a need uh, to do so. But also, uh, it's going to be critical for this policy 
to contribute to innovation, to contribute to um, us uh, moving towards a knowledge economy. So um, what we will do is to ensure that we uh, also make provisions for exceptions for research, exceptions for experimental use, uh, also within the scope and uh, the parameters of the TRIPS agreement. So those are some of the um, key reforms uh, that we're introducing. So we are at a stage where we are engaging critical stakeholders and all the stakeholders that are going to be affected. And we're looking forward to uh, stakeholders making the necessary submissions uh, before the deadline so that we can incorporate um, the, 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 the comments. Of course, as I said, um, the, the, the critical aim is to ensure that we achieve the appropriate balance to protect IP rights, but at the same time, ensure that we respond to the key development dynamics of the country. Intellectual property uh, policy uh, affects a number of critical areas. Uh, I've just spoken now about public health and the importance of ensuring access uh, to medicines. Um, many African countries, including South Africa, face um, a disease burden, which means that we need to ensure that we have mechanisms in place that will ensure that uh, we encourage innovation when it comes to medicines, we encourage research and development when it comes to medicines, which is why IP rights and the protection of IP rights is important. But also at the same time, there's a need to ensure that we respond to the socio-economic uh, challenges facing many of our countries. Uh, intellectual property policy is very important for African countries uh, because Many African countries are faced with um, a need to respond uh, to the socio-economic uh, challenges that uh, is facing many African countries. And this includes issues around uh, public health, the need to ensure that we effectively utilize our genetic resources um, to respond to our own uh, development dynamics. But also there are issues that are associated with uh, competition within the various aspects uh, that face um, uh, IP, including uh, the issues related to, to public health. Uh, so it's going to be important uh, that if we are to move as African countries towards a knowledge economy, which is where um, globally um, the world is moving towards, now there's a lot of discussion globally around the fourth industrial uh, revolution, which requires um, really uh, a focused approach on um, a knowledge uh, economy. There are priorities that we've defined for ourselves as the continent, and one of those um, is the need to ensure that we promote industrial development and the development of regional value chains. And one of the critical sectors that has been prioritized is pharmaceuticals, uh, together with uh, mineral beneficiation as well as agro-processing. And um, IP policy is quite critical uh, to a thriving pharmaceuticals industry uh, because IP uh, policy encourages research and development, encourages innovation. So we're looking at a, a, a way of promoting cooperation as African countries under the continental free trade area negotiations, which is an issue that will be dealt under phase two of the CFTA negotiations to look at how we can cooperate uh, in relation to uh, uh, IP policy as well. So it's a fundamental issue and um, that will require that uh, as African countries we work together collaboratively towards the development of IP policies that will assist us to pursue our development integration agenda but also at the same time ensure that we protect IP rights and uh, respond to the development goals of the continent as set out in Agenda 2063. Well, um, African countries are relatively small uh, by global standards, and um, Africa only contributes about 3% uh, to, to global trade. And the reason for that marginal contribution to global trade is because um, we are struggling as a, as a continent to um, respond effectively and efficiently to um, processing of our products, 
and also ensure that we produce more value-added uh, products. And as a result, uh, we mainly exporters of primary uh, products and mainly minerals and agricultural products to the rest of the world and import mainly value-added uh, products. And that puts a lot of pressure uh, on the resources and it also one of the issues that contributes to a growing trade deficits for many African countries because we export low value products but import high value products. And as a continent we had to look at how do we ensure that as African countries we are able to move up the value chain. And uh, we had to assess what is the appropriate approach to uh, integrating our economies both within the continent but also to integrate our economies into the global economy. And what became clear to us is that we need a nuanced approach to regional integration. So what we're currently uh, pursuing as a continent is a development integration approach that is premised on three pillars. And those pillars include uh, the first pillar being the market integration um, agenda. And the market integration agenda is really about ensuring that we are able to integrate our markets through the negotiation of free trade uh, arrangements in the continent. We have um, made very good progress uh, with the negotiations of the tripartite free trade arrangement between COMESA, and EAC as well as uh, SADC. We are also embarking on a very ambitious uh, project of negotiating a continental um, FTA that will mean that we are able to combine our markets and have a free flow of goods and services across the continent from Cape to Cairo. It's a market uh, of about 1.2 billion people when combined. It's a market of about 2 trillion US dollars in terms of GDP. So it's a market of a significant size. And the good thing about um, the market integration agenda is that it will improve the continent's ability and value proposition to attract investment into Africa's productive sector. So in that way, we will be able to respond to the broader socioeconomic challenges, be able to create uh, jobs in the continent, be able to uh, process our products, be able to attract investment into Africa's productive sector, and thereby um, able to integrate our economies into the global economy. The second pillar of the development integration agenda is around um, industrial development. Uh, we have prioritized three sectors, as I've indicated before. Um, infrastructure, um, we prioritized um, as well um, uh, the issue of ensuring that we're able to promote interconnectivity between uh, the, the markets because there's a big challenge that we currently have in the continent in that the current infrastructure uh, that we have was based on colonial arrangements where uh, most of the infrastructure, whether you're talking about roll and rail, I mean roads and, and rail, it's really about moving a commodity or product from a specific locality into the harbor. So in terms of an integrated infrastructure, uh, we, we really is uh, still trying to deal with that. So there is a, a, a targeted program uh, on infrastructure development which aims to uh, promote the development of corridors uh, within the continent to link um, the various countries together so that we can have an efficient movement of goods and services uh, in the continent. So really the importance of the regional integration agenda is about ensuring that we position the continent uh, so that it is able to uh, promote a sustainable development as well as inclusive development and integrate our markets uh, into the global economy, but also, as I've said, move up the value chain. We've made uh, impressive uh, progress as the continent uh, towards uh, the negotiations of one, um, the tripartite uh, free trade arrangement between Commerce and the EAC. 
but also regionally within the regional economic communities. Uh, a lot of regions already have functional FTAs. For example, in SADAC, uh, we launched um, the SADAC free trade arrangement uh, in 2008, and uh, that really contributed to the growth of intra-regional trade. Um, the challenge that we have as the continent due to uh, the challenges of um, lack of productive capacity but also supply side constraints, including uh, the lack of adequate infrastructure is that we have low levels of intra-Africa trade uh, that account currently for between 12 to 16 percent of Africa's global trade. And that is very low uh, by global standards because most regions, uh, they trade more within the region than with the outside world. And the EU, for example, its intra-regional um, uh, trade is above 60 percent while in the continent it's really around 16%. Um, so the challenge that we have is to promote intra-regional trade. And as a result, um, there is a, a comprehensive uh, program through the Development Integration Agenda to deal with the supply side as well as productive capacity constraints so that we are able to trade amongst ourselves. So um, the current uh, regional arrangements have been the basis upon which we're building in order to promote and negotiate um, uh, the broader continental FTA uh, negotiations. In terms of progress, um, we are currently, um, as you would recall, um, heads of states had uh, set a, a time frame of December 2017 as a time frame within which we should launch uh, the continental FTA. A lot of progress has been made towards achieving that objective and the Continental FTA is one of the priorities that have been set in Agenda 2063. Um, we are in a good space uh, to conclude the legal framework that will establish uh, the Continental FTA um, by the end of December. Of course, um, uh, the legal framework just sets uh, the framework that will underpin the continental FTA. There's a lot of work uh, that still has to continue beyond uh, December, which will include um, the tariff negotiations. Um, so um, we are, as I said, uh, in a very good space to conclude uh, the legal framework. And the legal framework will cover two areas, because under the continental FTA negotiations, we're looking at um, both trade in goods and services. So there will be a protocol on goods, there will be a protocol on services that will be concluded uh, by December, and then the overall legal framework uh, that will underpin uh, the negotiations. Um, the agreements uh, will still need to go through a legal vetting process before we can say they can be adopted by the heads of state but the process is really quite advanced. The next steps thereafter will be to negotiate specifically on rules of origin and negotiate uh, the tariff uh, phase down. So there's a lot of progress that has been made. The reason uh, we are here in Washington um, is that uh, we are here to engage uh, with the stakeholders, uh, US stakeholders, in relation to uh, the current developments around uh, the development of the comprehensive IP policy. So we've met with a number of stakeholders, both within the U.S. government, uh, but also within um, the, the private sector and civil society, because uh, we believe that we, in order for us to have a, or achieve the appropriate balance when it comes to uh, the IP policy, we need to be as transparent and as consultative as possible. And over the development of this policy, we have been engaging uh, quite proactively with um, all the stakeholders, in, including U.S. Uh, stakeholders. So again, it's another opportunity for us to engage with U.S. stakeholders um, so that we, we can um, have an appreciation of uh, where we're coming from with regards to this policy, but also we can put everyone at ease that South Africa, through this process, aims to strengthen uh, IP protection aims to leverage uh, the IP policy 
uh, to be able to achieve its development objectives, which also includes, among others, um, ensuring that we are able to promote local manufacture. And as I've said, um, what we are trying to do is to adopt a balanced approach. Uh, so we want to ensure that this policy contributes to the development of uh, medicines in South Africa in a balanced way that also ensures that we promote the participation of multinational companies in that process uh, through a consultative uh, process. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it really depends on the specific issue. Uh, but if most issues are specific to the U.S., um, the U.S. will consult um, its own uh, stakeholders. Um, we do have policy dialogues uh, through, for example, um, for the beneficiary countries and our GOA. There are uh, policy dialogues uh, from time to time. So those would be the, the processes high level uh, for, for consultations. But um, in the case of, of the IP, uh, for example, um, we would not necessarily um, uh, be, be consulted. But of course, um, the reason uh, for, for us to be here as a country um, to engage US stakeholders when it comes to, to IP um, is uh, to take a proactive approach to ensure that we go through a thorough consultative process with all the stakeholders that are likely uh, to be affected by the policy. Uh, South Africa, through the constitutional processes that it has, allows uh, all stakeholders um, uh, who are going to be affected, so we have a very uh, thorough democratic process of consultations, which is not only confined to um, South Africans, uh, which opens a room uh, for um, also international stakeholders to make inputs into the process. So we've uh, decided to be proactive and engage uh, US stakeholders because we really want to ensure um, that the policy responds uh, to all uh, the stakeholders, protects IP, but at the same time allows us the policy space as a country to respond uh, to our development uh, dynamics. And of course, um, in the case of medicines, uh, we've um, had a difficult uh, time uh, with the US uh, pharmaceutical companies in the 1998-99 uh, process. Uh, and we've decided this time around to really have a thorough consultative process so that our processes are transparent and are able to respond uh, to all um, the needs, including the needs of South Africans in terms of achieving its own development objectives. Because our constitutional processes um, do not necessarily bar um, any input from interested, all interested stakeholders uh, to engage in our process. So we prefer to adopt a proactive approach uh, so that as we implement the policy, um, we ensure that we implement it in a balanced uh, way uh, so that we achieve uh, the development uh, objectives of the country. And uh, the reason for also the proactive engagement is to ensure that uh, we, uh, because the U.S. is also one of the uh, biggest investors in our economy, especially with regards to the pharmaceutical sector of which uh, the phase one um, is covering. So we've had engagements um, with all the stakeholders, both in South Africa, but also we felt it fit uh, to proactively engage with stakeholders also in the US. And the aim uh, is to find uh, the appropriate uh, balance that of course uh, puts uh, the interests of South Africans and South Africa uh, as outlined in its national development uh, objectives, but also at the same time achieve uh, the necessary uh, balance when it comes to the protection of IP as enshrined in the South African Constitution.